Okay. If you uh, take your seats, we'll get started in just a second here. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Mackinac Center. Uh, my name is Mike Wrights. I'm the Executive Vice President here at the Mackinac Center, and it's great to see uh, friends and new faces, so thank you for joining us. I hope you had a chance to meet some of the Mackinac, uh, the Mackinac team members, uh, including, um, well, just, just about uh, everyone here on the team. And uh, Joe Lehman is here, our president, and I hope you have a chance to shake his hand uh, either before the event or, or afterwards. I want to offer a, a special uh, welcome to people who have already been recognized earlier today, uh, Ed and Elise Rogers, uh, longtime Mackinac Center supporters, uh, but earlier today uh, at a separate luncheon, not sponsored by us, uh, they were recognized for their civic leadership and uh, philanthropy here in, in Midland, and just appreciate all you do, and thank you for, for joining us today. And I'm told that this year is they will be celebrating their 65th anniversary, or as Ed likes to say, almost four score and seven years ago. <laughs> uh, speaking of anniversaries, this year is the 30th anniversary of the Mackinac Center. We were founded in 1987 uh, by a handful of, uh, of founding members. Uh, two of them are still on our board today, Joe Olson and Richard McClellan. And uh, we have always worked to shape the climate of public opinion. Uh, we want lawmakers to do the right thing. Even if we don't always agree with them, uh, we want to make sure that, they, that our ideas uh, and the ideas of uh, markets and liberty get a fair and full hearing uh, in, in Lansing and around the state. And so we, we do that through our research and through our uh, litigation and our journalism. And I know you're very familiar with all of that. But over 30 years, uh, you start to look at, at, at what, what have we done? You know, what, what is it that, that we've, um, what, what mark have we left? And if you uh, review those 30 years, Mackinac Center ideas now are imprinted in state constitutions. They're imprinted in state statutes. Uh, they are spread all over the world, literally. And uh, many of the individuals who have worked here or have been trained here have gone, gone on to public service all around the, all around the world. Uh, we used to run a, a leadership conference here uh, in Midland uh, twice a year, bringing state think tank executives uh, together, uh, and, and even uh, think tank executives from all over the world. And we trained 600 people to do the work that we do here at, at the Mackinac Center and sent them on to do good work in their, their own communities. And uh, we've, we've put 11,000 high school students through debate training, and we are uh, continuing that program uh, online so that we can reach a, a wider audience, and just we're very, very proud of, of the lives that we've been able to touch. Uh, some of them you can see outside uh, this room on the screen where, where we uh, talk about policy really impacting lives. And, and that's why we do the work that we do, so that we can help people live their lives uh, to their full, full potential. So we've, we've shaped, shaped, the, uh, shaped the future for 30 years. We look forward to the next 30 years, and we're, we're glad that you can, can be a part of it. So why are we here today? Uh, in a second, I'm going to invite Andrew Collinger to uh, introduce our speaker. But you know, we like to think about um, the, the great events, uh, both in history and current affairs, uh, that shape the world. And we like to understand those things uh, really in a historical context and in a context that that uh, dives deep, and we thought this, uh, you know, if, if there was a number one event in, in uh, 2016, it may have been the election of Donald, Donald Trump as president, uh, but I would say a close second uh, in terms of the, the, the world events would be uh, Great Britain's decision to leave the European Union. And we thought that we would deeply, or we would greatly benefit from hearing from one of the architects of that campaign uh, who led that effort and uh, we'll be hearing from him in just a moment. Uh, Andrew Collinger is gonna come up and introduce Matthew Elliott. Uh, Andrew is uh, the project director for our citizen engagement app, VoteSpotter. And if you don't have VoteSpotter, uh, we'll have information about it uh, at the end of the program, but you can get it on your phone, you can find out what your lawmakers are doing, what they're voting on, and you can give them your instant feedback whether you like it or not. Uh, and I find that it's very satisfying to tell them when you don't like it. So uh, I encourage you to check that out. But Andrew, why don't you come up and uh, introduce our speaker today.
Uh, as Mike said, my name's uh, Andrew Kohlinger. I'm the Vote Spotter Project Director here at the Mackinac Center, um, and I have the privilege of introducing our speaker this today. Uh, Matthew Elliott is a senior fellow at the Legatum Institute and one of the United Kingdom's foremost political campaigners. Uh, his most recent engagement was serving as CEO of Vote Leave, uh, which was the official Brexit campaign in the 2016 European Union referendum. He led the 2011 No to AV campaign against the alternative vote and turned what was a strong majority in favor of changing Britain's voting system to, strongly, uh, to a strong majority against. He's also the founder of the Taxpayers Alliance, which is the UK equivalent to uh, Americans for Tax Reform. He's also founded Business for Britain, um, which formed the basis for the Vote Leave campaign. Business for Britain recruited over 1,500 business leaders from across the country, including uh, the entrepreneurs behind iconic British brands Dyson, JCB, and Silver Cross, amongst many others. Uh, the group introduced a seminal 1,000-page study um, called Change or Go, which I know Matthew will probably mention something about uh, during his talk, uh, and that served as the key blueprint for Britain's exit from the EU. The Financial Times recently described Elliott as one of the most formidable political strat strategists in Westminster. Very high praise. Uh, and the new European Union called him the unsung titan of the British Brexit cause. Uh, Matthew Elliott is a partner at Awareness Analytics Partners, which is a technology form uh, providing a broad range of digital marketing, social media, and data analytics services. He has written four books, numerous op-eds, and is regularly interviewed on television and radio as well. Um, I've had the opportunity to hear him speak in the past. I work very closely with him and his business partners on a regular basis, and I can assure you, uh, every interaction I've had with him, I have learned something new, and I expect today to be no different. So please join me in welcoming Matthew Elliott. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Mike. And I just want to say what a pleasure it is to be here today. Um, it's a great testament to Joe and your team, and I know your support is in the room, um, how effective the Mackinac Center is. I've been coming to the US now for um, over 14 years to actually learn how to, uh, my campaign techniques, I learned about how to set up a taxpayer group from Grover Norquist at Americans for Tax Reform. So I've been attending conferences and actually seeing how effective that the Mackinac Center is. And it's been a huge pleasure to work with you and your team on Vote Spotter. And I hope it's, um, I know it's having a big impact already. So it's great to be here today and actually see the Institute. Um, it also feels like I'm coming home in a sense because I, um, I've married an American. Uh, when I was going to Americans for Tax Reform 14 years ago, little did I realize I was gonna meet my um, future wife, uh, Sarah. And her um, grandfather, um, worked for uh, General Motors as head of marketing. So they lived in both uh, Birmingham, in the Birmingham area uh, some years ago. So um, I'm looking forward to visiting that later on um, this weekend. So it's really good to be here today. Feels like I'm sort of coming home and uh, seeing this place for the first time. I want to start by talking a little bit about 2016, because like um, Andrew and Mike said, um, it really was a seminal year in um, history. And if you think back to the uh, post-war period, um, we saw sort of several changes going on. In Britain, you had the post-war consensus where all the parties seemed to support the creation of the National Health Service and the welfare state, and then went along with the sort of Keynesian uh, demand management. And then along came, of course, uh, Margaret Thatcher. Uh, I know in the US, uh, Ronald Reagan came along at, uh, just after Thatcher. And you saw a move to a new political consensus. And then in the 1990s, we saw uh, people like uh, Tony Blair and Bill Clinton and Gerhard Schroeder in Germany bringing in a new wave of politics, the third way, trying to sort of bridge the path between uh, what they saw as being sort of far-right free market economics and um, socialism on the other hand. And I think that what we've seen in the past um, year with both the Brexit vote and also with the uh, election of Donald Trump is a move towards a new political consensus. And it's not just in the UK and the US that we're seeing this. I think we're starting to see it in other Western European countries as well. So it's a very exciting time politically and a very important time for people involved in the uh, policy world, think tanks, campaigners, 
to actually try and shape the ideas that will be shaping the history for the next uh, decade or two decades to come. And Brexit was um, a huge um, part of that in the UK. And in a sense, this has been building up for um, a number of years. Britain, in a sense, never um, particularly fitted in with the European project. We joined back in the 1970s when we thought it was going to be um, a trade bloc. And you know, Britain wasn't doing so well economically in the um, 70s. And the idea of joining what we saw as being a free trade bloc you know, made a lot of sense. And it was you know, understandable that people voted to join at that point. But it turned from being a trade bloc into being a political um, union. And I don't know if you know, but we're now in a situation where 60%, 60% of UK law is now made um, in Brussels by politicians who are not accountable to the UK electorate, by people who are out of touch, by an elite who live um, a very different life to um, ordinary people living in the UK. And I think that detachment from our lawmakers was a huge part of uh, the reason why Britain voted to leave. And the slogan of Vote Leave was take back control. And we wanted to take back control over our lawmaking uh, to the UK level, to the House of Commons, uh, to elect uh, MPs who we actually were able to hold accountable for their um, actions. That was a huge part of the um, driving force. Um, part of it was um, migration as well. Um, what we'd seen over the past um, sort of 15 years was a situation where um, when the European Union expanded to include the East European member states, um, Tony Blair, who is then our Prime Minister, he predicted that um, 13,000 people a year would come from the East European countries to live and work in the UK, which for the ordinary Britain would seem like a sort of manageable number. When it turned out to be um, two and a half million under his time as Prime Minister, that is a very different um, level of uh, migration, and one which the British people didn't feel that they had uh, voted for or consented to. So again, they wanted to take back control and have a system where UK politicians were the ones who determined what levels of migration we needed for the UK economy and what skills we needed to make our economy a success. So migration was an element too. I think also um, the economy was. And similarly to over here, you know, being, living through the, uh, the financial crisis, you know, taxpayers reluctantly um, agreed to the bailout of the banks. We never voted on it, but you know, through gritted teeth, uh, we went through with the bailout, having been told by the politicians that was necessary to keep the um, economy going. But then over time, in the decade since the financial crisis, people didn't particularly see their wages rise or their living standards rise. And they saw um, public services in the UK become more and more stretched and less good than they, what they used to be. And I think, again, that added to the feeling that what's happened to the political elite? You know, why aren't they looking after the ordinary people living in the UK? So I think that was a huge part of the push as well. And then as well as those long-term factors, I'd like to think that we fought a good campaign. Um, you know, bringing it together was um, a huge effort. Uh, we had two big things to fight against. The first one was Project Fear. What the government did was to encourage um, all the government departments and all the big uh, world organizations like the um, IMF and the OECD and the World Bank to produce reports saying how terrible it would be if Britain was to vote to leave the um, European Union, and how our economy would collapse, how growth would collapse, how unemployment would go up, um, how we'd go into recession straight away. So they really try to scare people into voting to remain in the um, European Union. And uh, we had to fight against that. And thankfully, um, people saw through it. And I think the reason they saw through it is because back in the early 2000s, when the countries across the EU 
were deciding whether or not to join the Eurozone and adopt the Euro, British voters were told that if we didn't join the Euro, um, we would see unemployment rise to 3 million. They would see the collapse of the City of London and the oil banks moving to Frankfurt and to Paris. And we would see a collapse in growth in the UK. And of course, that didn't happen. Britain kept the pound. We still have an independent currency. Uh, we kept the pound. And the economy has done extremely well. I would say far better than the, the Eurozone economy. So the fact that the same people came back uh, 15 years later and said it would be terrible, 3 million unemployment, you know, the collapse of the city, collapse of growth, if you vote to leave. I think people saw through that because they saw that these people had essentially lied to them back in the early 2000s. That really assisted us. And then, of course, from a campaigning point of view, we needed to work out how to build a campaign from scratch, which is a tough thing. You know, it's not like you're a political party that has an infrastructure in place and activists already in place. Of course, there were groups involved in this area and the, you know, the Business for Britain group that I set up um, and built up a good cadre of business leaders who were supportive of our campaign. But we needed to build an army of activists to be able to reach voters right across the country. And of course, what we made use of in a big way was um, social media. And one of the great innovations, I think, of the Vote Leave campaign was the fact that we spent um, you know, a huge proportion, um, up towards half towards the end of the campaign, of our funding on social media. Uh, and traditionally in the UK, we're not allowed to have TV ads, unlike over here. But traditionally, campaigns have put a lot of their money into uh, billboards and into newspaper ads. But in today's day and age, a lot of that money is wasted. Um, you don't know who's going to see the billboards or who's going to see the uh, newspaper ads. And when they do see them, you have no means of um, collecting their data or working out who your supporters are. And this is why we really innovated by putting you know, the vast bulk of our resources into social media to make sure that we could not only engage with people in a more targeted fashion, but also collect you know, their data and collect their support and know where our support base lay. And it's really good to see that the Mackinac Centre as a think tank is really you know, paving the way in this area too. Because I think that for uh, public policy groups, the way to really work out where your support lies and to be able to mobilise your support for the big policy battles ahead is through a lot of investment into um, social media. And Vote Spotter is a great way of um, doing that. So what's happened um, since Brexit? Well, obviously, the day after the vote, uh, David Cameron uh, resigned as Prime Minister. And within a matter of weeks, we had um, Theresa May as our new Prime Minister. It happens very quickly in the UK because it's the MPs who select the next Prime Minister. And it's usually voted on by the party members as well, but um, all her opponents had dropped out of the race by that point. So uh, Theresa May was elected uh, unanimously. And I think it's a great thing that she was elected because she was um, what's called a reluctant Remainer. It was more of a marginal decision, I think, for her about whether or not Britain uh, remained or left the European Union. She came out for Remain, but was a lot more sensible than a lot of the other politicians on the Remain campaign. And she said during the campaign that where she felt that on balance Britain should remain in, that she was confident that if Britain voted to leave, we could survive economically outside of the um, European Union. And since the vote and since she became Prime Minister, she's really embraced this with the, with the zeal of a convert. And uh, she set up two new departments. We've got a department for exiting the um, European Union, which is in charge of all the negotiations, headed up by David Davis. And we've got uh, a new department for international trade, headed up by uh, Liam Fox, because... Um, at the moment, the UK, of course, doesn't control our trade policy. So it's not the UK government who decides what our tariffs are or what our quotas are for different goods. It's the EU. So we have to set up that from um, scratch. So she's got, got that going. And she's done um, two very good things. The first one is to um, make sure that she's really done her homework before starting the negotiations. So 
the, she formally triggered what's called Article 50, which is the, the mechanism for leaving the European Union. She triggered this Article 50 about eight, eight weeks ago. So she gave herself some months to get all her ducks in a row, to do her homework, to set up these departments, and she's now triggered it, and the negotiations have started. And that'll be um, a two-year process. And both sides want to get it done basically within 18 months. So expect to see the final deal sometime, perhaps in September of 2018. And that will then give three months for it to be ratified by the European Parliament and by the other national parliaments. And then I suspect that we'll leave uh, on the new year of 2018, 2019, uh, that 31st of December. I suspect that's the timeline they're working towards. So that'll be the point when Britain will formally leave the EU. And there may be some um, interim measures, some transition measures for um, a year or 18 months uh, as we move formally outside of the EU, but uh, that's not a problem. Um, so I expect that you know, on that glorious day, 31st of December 2018, is when we finally leave. Um, now, where does the balance of power lie in the negotiations? Um, I think sometimes the media, and often the, um, I must say, the US press is particularly bad at this. I'm thinking of the sort of Washington Post and the New York Times. Um, you read articles as if the uh, negotiations are going disastrously and as, as if things are going really badly for the UK at the moment. And every little briefing they get from the um, European uh, Commission or from President Juncker, uh, they seem to report as if the negotiations have stalled and Britain's going to lose out. Um, I actually think Britain's in a pretty strong position in these negotiations for two reasons. The first reason is that we are um, the second largest net contributor to the EU budget. So um, aside from Germany, we're the main country that put money into the pot every year. And that means that we're in a fairly strong position when it comes to negotiating the, uh, the financials here. I think they'll use that as um, leverage. And secondly, Britain, unfortunately, has um, a big trade deficit with the um, European Union, some um, £80 billion uh, pounds a year. So why on earth wouldn't they want to have a trade deal uh, with the UK? It makes sense for them to want to have a free trade deal with the UK to continue tariff-free and quota-free trade with the UK so they can continue selling us their goods. You know, we are the biggest export destination for the rest of the European Union. So it makes sense for them to want to keep that free trade going. So I'm very confident we will see more headlines about how badly the negotiations are going and how they've um, you know, hit a hole in the road. But actually, I think the deal will be done probably at the 11th hour, but they will come to a sensible deal. It will be a win-win situation. You know, good for the UK, because we'll be out of the European Union, but good for the European Union as well, because it will cement the fact that we have free trade, but also show that we still be good neighbours, cooperating on areas where we need to cooperate on uh, going forward. The final point I want to talk about is um, um, the US and the UK. Um, Andrew mentioned that I'm um, a senior fellow at the Legatum Institute, which is a think tank in London. And one of the areas I'm looking at is um, a US-UK trade deal. And I know that trade policy at the moment in the US is um, controversial. So I don't want to sort of necessarily step in that area um, too much. Um, and I know that um, uh, you know, questions have been raised about NAFTA and renegotiating, that sort of thing. I'm really pleased, though, that um, President Trump uh, made it so clear, both during his election and since, that he wants to do a trade deal with the UK. And I think that whatever you think about trade deals generally, having a trade deal with a country which is of a similar wealth and a similar uh, GDP per capita and has a shared history um, with the uh, UK can only be a good thing. I mean, already our economies are really uh, quite interlinked. I was looking up just before I came, uh, came through. Um, the, uh, perhaps I could have some guesses here. Um, how, 
what value do you think exports are from Michigan to the UK each year? Any guesses? Joe? I was looking at James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> It's, um, it's about a billion dollars a year, um, which from one state to the UK is actually a lot of money, I think. It's a, it's, it has a lot of value there. So um, I hope that not only would a US-UK trade deal be good for um, uh, the states as a whole, the US as a whole, but also good for um, Michigan as well. So um, President Trump is coming over to the UK in October for an official um, state visit. Um, so we'll be visiting the Queen and going to Balmoral and that sort of thing. Um, I'm hoping also at that point uh, both governments will start preparing the way for this trade deal. Because despite what you may read in the newspapers, there's nothing wrong with the country starting to talk about trade deals before Britain leaves. And already Liam Fox and his department are in talks with countries right across the world to make sure there are trade deals in place for the moment when Britain leaves the EU. And for me, that's the big win out of all this for the UK. Because the real reason, um, aside from our loss of sovereignty and our lawmaking, the real disadvantage of the UK being in the EU was that it was becoming a regional protectionist trade bloc. Um, it was, had free trade within the EU, but it had huge barriers to trade with the rest of the world. And if Britain is going to secure its economic future going forward, we need to have trade deals with the US, but we also need to have trade deals with fast-growing parts of the world like China and India. And to me, that's a really exciting future uh, for Britain going forward, having those trade deals we need to make sure that we have that success well into the 21st century. Thank you very much. Do you have some questions? Please. Um, I think a poll was done during the presidential election um, asking British voters, not they had a vote, but asking Britain, British voters who they'd vote for in a, pre in a presidential election. And I think um, Hillary got about 95% in that poll. Um, <laughs> so um, I think you could sort of see where the UK sentiment was um, towards Donald Trump at the time. I would actually say that um, since his election and since he entered the White House, um, things have probably changed somewhat. Um, I haven't actually seen any figures recently, but um, I suspect that, um, you know, like a lot of people, people are sort of pleasantly surprised with how things have gone in his first um, 100 days. Maybe from 5% gone to 15%. <laughs> So I think some of it was based on that. And of course, you always have um, politicians wanting to uh, posture. Uh, when the news came up of his visit to the UK, different politicians in the House of Commons said, well, he can't come and speak here and this sort of thing. But I think you can be assured that he's, it's a full state visit. He'll be seeing the Queen. He's going to go to Balmoral. I think that Balmoral is one of the few places with a private golf course and one of his wishes is to go there and actually play on the Queen's private golf course. Um, so we'll probably um, see that um, as well. But I think that um, people are in the UK are keen uh, to talk to the US about trade. And I'm hoping that that will be a, the big theme when it comes to the visit. And if he repeats what he said previously about wanting to prioritise a, a US-UK trade deal, that will go down very well. Thank you. Uh, one of the things was that Obama had made it real clear to uh, Britain that if you go, vote in Brexit, 
I will punish you in trade negotiations because you will be doing something very wrong. Yeah. And so I would have thought when Trump came along and said, I'll cooperate with them and we'll come up with good stuff, probably that never made the press over there because it certainly didn't in the US. <laughs> it actually did make the press in the UK, funny enough. Um, of course, the whole um, Obama visit was covered extensively, uh, but it actually backfired because he, um, I actually remember this point in the campaign, he um, turned up on the, the Thursday and he made some um, quite measured remarks and there was something along the lines that the US prefer to do trade deals with um, big regional trade blocks like the European Union or like uh, the TPP uh, deal which was going on at the time. Um, and that deals with individual countries were uh, a lower priority. And, you know, that was quite a, sort of a reasonable thing to say. You could sort of understand him saying that. But then two days later on the Saturday, that's when he made his infamous comment about Britain being sent um, to the back of the queue. And the fact that he used the word queue rather than back of the line shows it was written for a UK audience in mind. Um, and that reacted very badly. And actually, the following week, uh, we saw the polling move in our favor. And that was almost like peak project fear. And from that point, things got better. But uh, President Trump's, or Donald Trump's uh, comments at that point did get coverage in the UK. And actually, surveys have been done which showed they had a net positive effect. So uh, we should thank him for a few points in the polls. I have two questions. One is, what happens to the rest of the EU? Uh, do they go on, and are, are other countries, is there yep. a risk for this, th that just to crumble at this point, or? And what was the second question? I, I was on the campaign side. Did any political parties align with, I mean, was there any kind of political alignment with the, part, with the infrastructures to help with, you know, the voting? So there's one political party in the UK, um, uh, the UK Independence Party. Um, I know that Nigel Farage appears on US TV a lot on Fox News, and he was the leader of the party at that point. And, uh, you know, of course, he was on the, um, the Brexit side. The trouble was that he um, never got more than 30% um, support in the polls in the UK. At his peak, that's what he'd get in European elections. And of course, you can't win a referendum on 30% in the polls. Um, so Vote Leave was set up as separate to UKIP uh, because its infrastructure wasn't actually that good. And um, because we also recognize you needed to appeal to those mainstream uh, swing voters. And that's why we set up a new organization you know, backed by you know, serious business leaders, but also having people like um, uh, Boris Johnson and Michael Gove and uh, some quite senior politicians involved, who people will be able to look at and think, well, I agree with that person, or I trust that person. Um, so we set up a separate organization. So there were some things in place, but it wasn't good enough. On the question about the rest of the EU, what happens there? Um, I mean, basically, they still go on as normal post-Brexit. But I, I predict that if the EU doesn't reform, um, it is going to break up because there's a lot of, there's a rising level of um, Euroscepticism um, within the EU. Look at the French elections um, alone. In the first round of the French presidential election, um, uh, you, you recall that um, Le Pen got, um, I think, 22% um, in the polls. And uh, Mélenchon, who is the far left candidate, who also wants France to leave the EU, I think he got 19% in the polls. So there you have 40% uh, you know, of French voters in the first round voting for candidates who wanted to leave the EU straight away. And then a further 19% voted for Fillon, who was a centre-right candidate, and he wanted France to have, um, bring powers back from the EU. So almost 60% of French voters voted on the Eurosceptic side. And you know, similarly in uh, Germany, you're seeing a rise of um, Euroscepticism. So I think that if the EU doesn't reform, 
you will start to see people breaking away, particularly if we see a big return of the migration crisis like we saw in 2015, and also if we see a return of the Eurozone crisis in a big way. I'm just uh, curious, with uh, Brexit, do you think that that will lead to uh, uh, deconstruction of some of the socialist programs that take place in Britain, like national health or other programs like that, where people say, hey, we want to have more freedom, more control of our lives, and uh, less reliance on the government and government programs and tax, high taxes? I don't think it'll lead to any changes with the, the National Health Service, which is um, you know, hugely popular in the, um, the UK. Um, and uh, yeah, I can't see any changes there. I think more generally when it comes to um, business regulations, um, I could see some changes um, happening there. Um, I mean, as you know, the UK um, is generally speaking more of a free market, uh, free enterprise country than the rest of the um, EU is. And certainly some of the regulations that came down from the European Union were really pushed back against by the UK government we had to go along with. So I could see going forward that some of the regulations that the EU brings in, we certainly wouldn't go along with. And uh, the Chancellor in the UK, Philip Hammond, has made it clear that he thinks that the best approach for the UK post-Brexit, and he was on the Remain side in the referendum, he thinks the UK needs to be um, a low-tax, low-regulation country in order to be able to continue to attract um, foreign investment. And I'm hoping that with the um, general election, uh, I'm pretty confident that Theresa May is going to get a huge majority. We had local elections um, yesterday, and those results came in overnight, and they were very, very good for the Conservatives. So I think she'll probably have a, like, a three-figure majority in the House of Commons. And that will mean that she'll probably have two terms, so up to 10 years as Prime Minister, or a Conservative government being in office for 10 years. And that's a very good sign, I think, for... Uh, businesses and, and investors overseas. There's a good sort of free market, free trading, free enterprise government in place in the UK. There is a lot of speculation that banks may move to uh, leave Britain. I don't know. Again, because of, I'm not sure, but sure. do you feel that's a real possibility? So the question was about, I'm just repeating, because you know the microphone. Um, the question was about the, uh, the banks and whether the banks would leave uh, the UK and the City of London. I think that's been um, overemphasised. I think that um, the reason why the City of London is so successful is not because of Britain's membership of the um, European Union. It's been built up over centuries um, as a sort of centre of financial services within, the, um, within Europe, and indeed the rest of the world. Um, you know, the fact that there's a very strong um, uh, you know, legal uh, system in the UK and uh, great professional services in London, you know, accountancy, management consultancy, uh, the time zone, the language. Um, I was at um, a conference in LA just a few days ago and one of the people on the panel um, asked the audience when he was asked the same question, um, would you rather live in London or Frankfurt? And it was an audience of about 250 people, and one hand went up for uh, Frankfurt. So I think um, there's something about living in London where people um, from overseas like it, um, and it's more congenial than living in Frankfurt or Dublin. So a question about uh, polls and and uh, data. Sure. So in the U.S., obviously the media and the, the polls completely missed it in terms of where the U.S. electorate was in the presidential election. I think it was somewhat the same way with the Brexit vote. Um, and you guys do analytics work. Are we seeing something about how polling is done, in t whether people are in touch or out of touch with the electorate? Are we seeing a shift in how traditionally things have been viewed and how they will be viewed in the future? And are we, gonna, are we seeing anything that's going to change in the future about how people try to, to do polls or measure where the electorate is on things? I actually think that um, in some ways the pollsters get a bad hearing um, and the commentariat use them as a, 
uh, an easy scapegoat when it comes to them getting their predictions wrong. And actually, both in the, um, in the UK, the Leave campaign was ahead in quite a few of the polls. And certainly in the final stretch of the campaign, it was always um, you know, a single-digit lead for one side or the other of perhaps up to 3%, but usually 1% or 2%. So it was always well within the margin forever error. And of course, the polling in the um, US um, similarly you know, put Hillary ahead, but you know, she did get more votes um, overall. And I think the big mistake was that people weren't uh, polling properly in the, uh, the Midwest, were they, in the Rust Belt states, and just taking those for granted that they'd, they'd fall into the, the Clinton uh, column. And had they been more open-minded and had the commentariat been more uh, in touch and actually visiting places and speaking to people, they would have realized that the strategy of taking those states for granted uh, was the wrong one for Clinton. So I think pollsters sometimes get um, a bit of a hard time. But that said, you're absolutely right to say that when it comes to uh, the analytics side of things, um, I would say that it's, um, it's the new way of polling. That basically we started off, certainly in the UK, with face-to-face uh, -face polling and knocking on people's doors. Then we moved to um, telephone polling, and of course, the problem with that now is that many people don't have or use landlines. Then we move to um, online polling through um, emails, which is better, but uh, now um, it's a skewed sample because only sort of more political types take part in that, apparently. So I actually think the analytics approach and studying what people are thinking in terms of their social media presence is actually a more accurate way forward. So. It's, um, you know, we're at the cutting edge of that, both at Vote Leave, but also in the work that we do with um, A2 Partners. We have a polarized press in the United States. Mm. What is the press like in Britain as far as giving Brexit a fair break in a sense? So the question was about the media and how they reported the Brexit issue. So the broadcasters, you know, most notably the BBC, which um, is a huge uh, you know, monopoly in the UK, and 70% you know, of people get their news from the BBC. So they weren't even-handed. So they were more on the Remain side in the referendum, and we had to constantly fight them to make sure that we got our message across there. I would say at the newspaper level, uh, things are much better for the Leave side. So um, there were newspapers like the, um, the Guardian and the Independent and the Mirror, which are on the Remain side and the Times. Um, but newspapers like the, uh, the Sun, the Mail, the Telegraph, the Express, um, some of the papers actually sell the most copies, they were actually on the, uh, the Leave side. And even the Times was very even-handed in its approach. It gave us a fair hearing. So uh, broadcast was terrible for us. Print was much better. Uh, but online is where we really sort of push things out. The question at the front. Uh, this is a follow-up question. Uh, you mentioned the uh, survival of the uh, European Union and about reforms, and uh, maybe you can tie that together with uh, what the importance was of uh, business for Britain. And are those reforms business-related, or how, what are those reforms? I'm glad you asked that, um, because Andrew said I was going to talk about this. So, um, I was. Sure. The question was about um, uh, basically how important reforms were and what sort of reforms businesses were looking for in that negotiation process. So just to take a step back, when David Cameron announced the referendum in 2013, um, he said he was going to have a period of renegotiation, uh, trying to get a better deal for the UK, and then we'd have the referendum on this new deal. And he talked about uh, bringing back powers to the UK level. He talked about making the EU more uh, business friendly and lighter on regulation. He talked about you know, pushing forward the trade agenda within the uh, European Union. Um, he basically achieved none of that. He came back with nothing. And even the BBC and the FT and the Guardian were basically saying there was no deal, that nothing had changed. So the logical extension of that was that we should vote to leave. And the slogan 
at Business for Britain was change or go. Because a lot of our business supporters wanted to give the Prime Minister the opportunity to actually try and get a better deal. But once he came back with uh, nothing, uh, basically felt the best course of action was to leave. So we, uh, at Business for Britain, we, we proposed a whole load of measures that would have been, uh, would have made for a good negotiation, basically putting Britain back onto a trading footing with the rest of the European Union. But sadly, those, um, those weren't taken up. It did, and I think it really brought home to voters as well that here's an organisation that is inflexible, that isn't open to change, that even with the threat of uh, Britain leaving the European Union and potentially leaving the European Union, even under that pressure, the European institutions wouldn't change their stance and wouldn't reform. And um, uh, yeah, who knows, but what they should take, the Brexit voters being, and also the rise of the Eurosceptic parties across the rest of the EU, is as a wake-up call to realise they do need to change and become more in touch if they're going to survive. Please. So, um, in the US, we have um, progressives that have a very strong position in the federal government, in the executive branch, the legislative, in the, um, in the judiciary. A uh, very strong presence of progressives in the media. I get these proxies from companies, and the big companies have uh, more and more. You see progressives appearing on the boards of directors of companies. You have, you have Al Gore on the Apple board of directors, which I, I, it's kind of shocking to me. Um, the U of M, uh, the lady that used to be the president of U of M, is on somebody's board, and so forth. So on the larger companies, you see more of a presence of progressives or starting to build, but then I, I look at the biotech companies, for instance, and they've got venture capitalists on their boards, they've got scientists on their boards, and they seem more interested in innovation and, and uh, you know, shareholder return and that kind of stuff. And I'm just wondering, and all these people have their own agenda, these progressives, as opposed to people that might be more venture capitalist oriented or, or more capitalist uh, oriented, that kind of thing. I'm just wondering if it's the same kind of thing. And these people are resistant to, you know, private property. I think that my model is they're resistant to private property rights and individual liberty and economic freedom. I'm just wondering if the same thing is, happens or has, you know, exists in Britain. And, you know, these people aren't going to lie still. They're going to want to pursue their own agenda. And how is that going to work out in, in uh, the UK? Does that make does that? The split that we saw in the, uh, in the business community was between the um, corporates and the entrepreneurs. So the companies that um, Andrew mentioned at the beginning that supported um, Business of Britain, those 1,500 companies, including companies like Dyson, you know, owned by the uh, inventor and entrepreneur James Dyson, um, you know, JCB, which is a family-owned company for excavators. Um, Silver Cross that did the push chairs. Again, it was privately owned. So the privately owned companies, uh, led by entrepreneurs, um, they seem to be more on the Eurosceptic side of things. And I think that was because they could always see um, beyond the short term. And I think sometimes with the corporates, Obviously, often in the UK, um, the average CEO lasts about four years um, as CEO of a, co of a co big corporate. And when you're in that situation, you don't want any short-term shocks. So basically, when things come along, like um, Brexit, um, you want to be very resistant to it because you're always obsessed by the next quarter's uh, results. So even if you actually think that actually the UK will be in a better position in the medium term, post-Brexit with these better trade deals around the world with lower regulation, uh, with you know, lower um, corporate tax rates, perhaps. Um, you still can't bring yourself to support it because you're obsessed by the short-term consequences of what you're uh, saying and doing. So the big split for us was the corporates versus the 
um, entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs tend to be more um, forward-looking, um, less risk-averse, but willing to take that, um, you know, that step into, um, into supporting leave because they knew that even if there were short-term consequences, um, that in the medium term, things will be infinitely better outside the EU. I think that it, um, it depends on two things. Um, first of all, um, um, Theresa May, as Prime Minister, and needs to recognise the concerns of um, many of the people who voted for Brexit, um, who had concerns about things like um, migration and wanted a more sensible migration system in the UK, who had concerns about how um, some of the public services were being run, um, and she needs to recognise those concerns. I think she has done that, and that's why she's done so well in the recent local elections and will do well in the general election. And um, similarly, th thinking about the UK context, the Labour Party has really uh, lost touch with its base. Um, I don't know how much news um, Jeremy Corbyn, who's head of the Labour Party, gets over here, but he is... Um, a radical, radical um, left-winger. He makes um, Bernie Sanders look like a centrist. Um, <laughs> you know, he's, he's way out there. You know, his um, shadow chancellor, his shadow finance minister, the person who would be looking after the country's uh, finances, was um, uh, filmed at a May Day parade um, at the beginning of the week with a flag behind him for um, Soviet Russia, and um, yeah, really bizarre. Um, so uh, these guys have basically lost touch with their base, and um, people like Jeremy Corbyn are too obsessed about um, uh, international issues like um, Israel and Palestine and you know, workers' revolutions going on overseas, rather than the bread and butter issues at their core base were concerned with in the uh, UK. And I think a similar thing can be said for um, the Democrats in the, the US. Um, the fact that, uh, I think I read somewhere that after the uh, primary season was over, um, Hillary Clinton you know, never visited, I think it was Wisconsin, again, during the, or Michigan, uh, during the entirety of the campaign, but she found time to do private meetings for uh, Goldman Sachs, I think, and get paid well, the Clinton Foundation get paid for that. So there's a wrong set of priorities there. And until they find a way of actually reconnecting with their base, and in the UK, that means acknowledging that, that people have voted for Brexit and actually you know, updating their stance to take that into account, I don't think the voters will be listening to them. Any final questions? I can see one there. Brexit, I was wondering if there was the same, uh, or, or I'd like to find out what you think about that and what about Wales and uh, Northern Ireland as well. I'm glad you brought that up, so I promised somebody to uh, talk about this. Um, uh, in Wales, uh, the majority of people voted for leave, so you know, that's uh, a sort of non-issue. Um, you're right, in both Scotland and Northern Ireland, uh, a majority of people voted um, remain. Um, in Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, the uh, First Minister there, 
has chosen to use as an opportunity to push for a second referendum. And um, I think the Prime Minister is taking a very sensible approach to this, uh, basically saying that once the next set of Scottish Parliament elections uh, are over, um, if um, she manages to get a majority in the Scottish Parliament um, in support of another referendum um, on Scottish independence, then she'll consider it. But up until that point, you know, why have another one? Because uh, she doesn't have a majority for one in Scotland, and uh, we've only just had one, so there's no need to have another one so soon. So, um, and if you look at the polling, um, support for Scottish independence is down at about 40% at the moment, partly because of the collapse in the price of oil, so the, the numbers don't add up now. Um, and also, many people who are for Scottish independence don't want to be ruled by the EU. You know, they're as sceptical about being ruled by the EU as being ruled by London. So the idea that Scotland would become independent and then sort of rejoin the EU or stay part of the EU, uh, you know, uh, grates with them as much as rule from London does. When it comes to Northern Ireland, um, again, there's no majority there to leave the UK, and I think they'll sort out any issues there are with the uh, border. And in fact, what we could see, not at the moment, but over the next few years, is actually the growth of Euroscepticism in Ireland itself. There's a huge overlap between the um, economies of Ireland and the uh, UK, more so than Ireland and the rest of the EU. And what you're starting to see is, first of all, Scotland will become a net contributor to the EU budget. And um, you'll be familiar with the fact that post-financial crisis, they made some quite big cuts in government spending, you know, proper cuts in government spending to try and get their books back in order. And yet they see other countries like um, Greece you're know, not making any significant attempt to rebalance their books. And that will build resentment. And then on top of that, you know, the Irish economy has been built on the fact that it has low corporate tax rates and is very business friendly. So companies like Google and Apple and other big companies you know, base themselves in Ireland. And the European Court of Justice uh, recently did a case where, I think it was with um, Apple, they forced the Irish government to give them a, a 13 billion euro tax demand for back taxes. And I think if that sort of pressure continues, uh, a penny will start to flip in Ireland. If the UK gets, as I believe it will, a good deal with the EU, then you might see the people of Ireland thinking that actually it's time for them also to leave the EU. Okay. Or Mike, even. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to let Joe and Andrew off the hook. I'll talk about Vote Spotter for a second. But I've just been informed by a colleague that my uh, flat New York tones are completely inadequate, and I should change my accent immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as we wrap up, I uh, just want to mention three Mackinac Center projects quickly to you, and, and one of them is VoteSpotter. We've talked about it. Uh, you can get that app on your phone, or you can go to the website, uh, votespotter.com, and use it there as well. It will tell you who your state and federal lawmakers are. It will tell you how they voted on key issues that you'll care about, and it will give you the opportunity to give them feedback, your feedback, about what they uh, voted on. And uh, we know from, from social science uh, research that the most powerful way to influence a lawmaker's thinking on a topic uh, is for a constituent to visit their office. But a very, very close second is just personalized contact from a constituent, whether it's a phone call uh, or an email, and VoteSpotter gives you the opportunity to do just that. And we know that it's getting through, so maybe if you've used it, you've asked yourself, do they really, are they really hearing from me when I send this feedback uh, to, a, to a state lawmaker? Well, just this week, uh, a colleague of mine, Ben DeGroe, who's our education director, uh, was meeting with a couple of, uh, a couple of parents um, uh, at a lawmaker's office, and this was a Democrat in, in Dearborn. And uh, these parents uh, were concerned about the quality of education in, in Michigan, and they asked this lawmaker, well, what can we do to make sure that we're informing our lawmakers on, on how how we want them to vote. 
And this Democrat lawmaker, who didn't know that we were working on this project, said, well, have you ever heard of Vote Spotter? And he recommended that they use that to uh, contact him and his colleagues. So it's kind of nice when lawmakers are doing your marketing for you. Second thing I want to mention is uh, a, a brand new database, uh, the very first one uh, ever published in, in Michigan like this uh, that we launched a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's the Michigan Salaries Database. So taxpayers, we think, uh, deserve to know how tax money is spent. And uh, like most enterprises, most of the money you spend in state government is on personnel. And so we released a database uh, with uh, details of uh, public employee salaries uh, both at the local level and the state level, uh, for about 300,000 uh, government employees, and we put that all on a searchable database. Now, this information is, has always been public, but it's hard to get at, and we're making it easy for people by putting it on an online database, and we encourage you to check that out. We do know that the, the public appreciates that information because just in a couple of weeks, we've had about uh, 600,000 visits to the website uh, where people are looking uh, things up. And ironically, most of the people visiting the website are government employees. <laughs> that website is michigangovernmentsalaries.com, and you can also get it from our website. If you're looking for some entertainment, and some inspiration uh, next weekend. Uh, I invite you to drive down to Detroit, and I invite you to attend the Detroit Children's Business Fair. Uh, this is a project that's a joint partnership between the Mackinac Center and Junior Achievement, and we are hosting a business fair, but you, you none of you could actually do this, uh, because you have to be under the age of 14 to uh, have a booth at our business fair. And we will have 25 booths of young people who are uh, showcasing either a product or a business. And uh, we'll be awarding a prize to, uh, to the top uh, businesses that uh, present their, their ideas to us. Uh, we do this, uh, and we've done it for a couple of years now. We do this, it's not exactly a think tank activity that you would normally think of, uh, but we do it so that young people can both uh, discover the joy of good old-fashioned work and also so that we can give them the knowledge and the awareness that they can really create their future and their future opportunities uh, with their own hard work. And so this is a lot of fun. It's one of our favorite events to do. That's on May 13 at the Detroit Historical Museum, and we've got information on that uh, if you'd like to, uh, like to join us. Uh, my wife, Rochelle, is here today, and it's a treat for me because she, she doesn't get to uh, come to many of these events. We've got three kids, and, and she teaches them at, at home. But one of the things that we're attempting to teach our children is gratitude. And you can show gratitude in many different ways. Uh, it can be uh, you know, a, a compliment. It can be a slap on the back. It, it can be a handwritten note. Uh, but one of the best ways is just to say thank you. And so thank you, Matthew, for, for joining us here today. Thank you to all of you for your support of the Mackinac Center, and thank you for joining us today. Have a good afternoon.